What's up gamers? I'm Josh and this is Copper Dragon Games. Today we're looking at some initiative tricks for running 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons on Foundry Virtual Tabletop. Let's get started. That call for a roll of initiative is one of those odd times in the game that you simultaneously have your player's full attention and yet the game may slow down to an absolute crawl as you try to move from a narrative based game into a very strict turn by turn management of actions. Luckily, if you're using a program like Foundry Virtual Tabletop, a lot of those things that would slow you down at a real table are automated, so you don't have to worry about them. But it is important to know how to use those features within the program so that you don't lose time and momentum trying to make it through that transition. We'll talk briefly about how to get an encounter started and then we'll go into some tips and tricks that I learned as I fumbled my way through my first couple combats using the program and hopefully help you avoid some of the mistakes that I made as I was starting out. When you first call for that initiative roll, your players may jump straight into adding themselves to the combat. I actually would advise against doing this. It's not that I want to take away control from players, it's just that there's a much easier way to add them all to combat than having every single person click on their character and add them to combat and having to wait for them to do that. Since your combats in Foundry Virtual Tabletop are tied to scenes, I actually think it's a lot more efficient for the DM to just drag and drop all the creatures that belong in that combat and add them all to the initiative tracker at the same time. It may not seem like that big of a deal, but it is actually a, a big time saver. And when you have a very limited time to play, every second counts. Speaking of all this automation, when I started out, I believed that I needed to click on every one of these D20s to roll initiative. And you can do it that way, but there is a more efficient way of rolling initiative. As long as the dexterity scores for all of the tokens are accurate on their character sheets, you can just roll this handy little roll all button which would show up completely on the screen instead of being cut off but uh, this little handy roll all button at the top right will roll all of the initiatives at the same time and then automatically sort them so that they're in the correct order uh, highest first now this works great when you have uh, a fairly small number of enemies this is actually not too overwhelming, but if you ever ended up in a situation where you had lots and lots of minions on the board, you may want to not have each of them represented individually on the initiative tracker. And to do that, I like to add an extra minion on the somewhere on the board that players can't see, either off the map entirely or in this case behind some behind some cavern walls in a space that won't ever actually be revealed to the characters. In this case, this lets us, instead of having this big list of characters in the combat, we can instead add just the PCs. Oops, let's actually get them all. And then take that one character and add it to the combat as well. And then we can set it up so that the players all act on their own turn and all the goblins act on the same end. Count. You can do this with just any old minion in the combat, but I have found that on some virtual tabletops, for example, Roll20, where the interface is fairly similar but the functionality doesn't exactly work the same, on their initiative tracker, if you used this and deleted the goblin that you added to the initiative counter, it would actually leave the initiative counter. Whereas in Foundry, we don't have to worry about that with the exception of a couple of add-ons that change that functionality. But because I've gotten used to it in other programs, I still add that extra token to the map just off screen, just in case I've updated my settings or updated my add-ons and accidentally added one that would change that effect. If deleting a token means that that creature will never participate in combat again, that's not a big deal. But if that token represents a big group of creatures and I delete it and their initiative count is gone, then I have to try to remember what initiative count they were acting on, which I may or may not remember in the heat of a session, and I would rather not lose that information in the first place. 
So my recommendation is, if you're going to have tons of monsters on the same initiative count, add an extra minion of that type to the board off screen somewhere so that you can never worry about that again. Another trick that I use within the game to keep my head on straight during a session is a little trick that I've developed with solo monsters. I know that technically a fire giant is not a solo monster, but I use this token just because it looks awesome. It's from one of Devon Knight's token packs and looks amazing, so I threw it on the board for this. If I wanted to make this fire giant a solo monster, then I can modify its stats to do that. And legendary monsters get those fun legendary and sometimes layer actions that take place on player turns. And I personally am terrible about forgetting to use them. And so in Foundry Virtual Tabletop, I have this trick that I use to make sure I don't forget. The last thing I wanna do is run up on the turn right before my solo monster and realize that I've only used one of the three and double it up right before his turn so that he essentially gets three actions in a row without players getting to react. That's not the intent of the rules and it kind of feels unfair to players so I avoid that by adding some proxy monsters to the board or to the initiative tracker. And Here's how I do that. First of all you add the monster itself and get it in the initiative count. Second, you'll need to make some legendary action tokens. These are just tokens that I've created that have literally no function in game other than as a reminder to me. We add those to the board, either in a place that players will never see, like behind walls, or you can put them on the board and make them invisible. by choosing them and hiding them. I don't think this one's actually out of player range because it overlaps the wall, but let's move it over so it's easier to select them. Once they're there, you can add them to the combat just like any other creature. And make sure that their visibility is off so players won't see them. Then you can modify their initiative so that it matches the end of certain players' turns. So in this case, I could modify here, make this 14, and it comes up just below the player that would act on the initiative count 14. So it's a reminder to me that when that player's turn finishes, I need to activate one of my layer actions or legendary actions. It only takes a couple seconds to set up. You can actually do it mid-combat especially if you have some players who um, will just say, take a few minutes in the middle of their turn to decide what they're doing. This is a, a really quick and easy reminder, and this will keep you on track throughout the entire combat of using legendary actions on player turns wherever it's appropriate. The only place it does come up as being a little tricky is uh, the monster itself typically has the freedom to pick and choose which player turns it acts on. You may modify this a little bit as the combat progresses, but just having these three reminders within the encounter helps me tremendously to make sure I don't forget those actions. A couple other things to look at. Uh, let's clear this combat really fast. Um, and I'm actually going to move our PCs off the map entirely. Because one thing that I have found helpful is to pre-roll initiative. Anytime you know fairly certain which monsters will be involved in an encounter, you can add them to an encounter ahead of time before players even enter the space. And pre-roll their initiative. then you know that when the players get added later on, their initiatives come up, they'll be added to the scene and entered in the order, and you don't have to worry about the monster initiatives at all. Personally, I don't think this is that big of a deal because if you can automate them all at the same time, there's just not that much reason to pre-roll. Uh, 
but there may be some systems out there that this is actually beneficial for. And if you want to simulate an enemy position that is really fortified and really prepared for attack, you can do this ahead of time and, and be thinking about what your tactics will be mid-combat. I say sometimes that the, the monsters are actually smarter than I would be, and so cheating, quote-unquote cheating, a little bit in this case, helps simulate some of those intelligence scores of 20-plus that I, as a DM, as a person, don't actually have, but that the monsters in the game, it gives a way to show that the monsters in the game are very highly intelligent and maybe think a lot more quickly on their feet than this humble dungeon master does when combat begins. I would use that tactic sparingly though because it is technically not really fair. You're, you're at a much greater advantage over your players when you get into that kind of thing. And you should be thinking through tactics ahead of time with all your monsters anyway, but I do think it's appropriate for those monsters who have really high intelligence scores or who are prepared for an attack for you to literally think through the first round or two of combat, knowing ahead of time what order the monsters will be playing in to help simulate that hyper-intelligent monster. Last but not least, while we're looking at combats, I do want to point out that you can set up many of them within the same scene ahead of time. So say you have a, a dungeon with 20 rooms in a page. You could actually set up those 20 encounters separately and just scroll over or click over to the combat that matches the room that the players just entered and have the monsters already added to the combat there. It might not save a ton of time, but I am a big proponent of Anything that you can do before a session, you should, just to try to save as much actual game time as possible. I don't know about you, but I never feel like I get to play as much as I want to, and saving every second at the table for actual play time and getting to skip as much of that random upkeep of just managing numbers is a big deal, and I think it's important. So that said, hopefully you've heard something in this video that you haven't thought of before, learned a little something about the encounter interface here and some initiative tricks. If you liked what you heard and want to hear more, I encourage you to visit the channel, subscribe below, and join us next time. Or if you have any tips or tricks of your own that you'd like to contribute and talk about in the comments, feel free to leave those down below. Until next time, this is Copper Dragon Games. Thanks for being here. We'll see you soon.